At, at least I'm going on a mission trip sometime, I guess, huh? Um, the, that was very good as far as pointed as far as ministry. It takes everybody to do ministry. Uh, one man or a group of individuals cannot do ministry. And it's fun to come up with ideas, but the follow through sometimes is very difficult. So whenever ministry takes place, we need to make sure that we have people in the, in the proper place to take care of that. Um, today is going to be a, a type of sermon that's going to be a, a carry on from our Mother's Day sermon. Our Mother's Day sermon, we were talking about relationships, talking about how to deal with those relationships and how to honor God in our relationships. And in that, we gave you a formula for how to deal with those relationships and how those relationships can work for you. And it gave you a six-level foundation. And the first level of relationship is when you just have basic information. You just Follow just basic information, like is the dinner ready, or are the kids asleep? The second level is partnership. Can you go to the store? Can you pick up the kids from soccer? We're just doing life together, but we are not engaging. We're not really enjoying life. We are just cohabitating in the same house. The third level became the level that most of us are stuck on and we can't get over. And this level is what we're going to talk about today. This level is conflict resolution. How do you deal with conflict? Conflict resolution is not we don't have a conflict, it is being aware of the conflict. It's understanding what we have to deal with and how we can deal with it. Because after you get through conflict resolution, if you get through conflict resolution, you get then and only then connection. You, you start talking about the things that you were afraid of before. You went through the conflict and you came out of the other side and you became a couple. You became somebody that can open up and share and talk before you went through the conflict resolution. That topic, <laughs> no, no, no. I'm not gonna touch that with a 10-foot pole. If I touch that, man, she would go crazy if I talked about that. So you know what? I'm just gonna stick that one in the sand and I, I'm gonna leave that one alone. But when we can open that up and we can talk about that, then it comes to the connection. We can openly, verbally, and non-verbally have connection. And then it comes to personal information. Once we've had that conflict resolution, and once we have connected, we have personal info information, our thoughts, we can talk about our dreams, our feelings, and our frustrations. Because when you are with somebody that can be completely open and honest, and you can share your deepest need, you have that connection, that personal information. But if you do not have these, you will never get to the top of the pier, and that's intimate communication. Talking about your desires, your needs, your wants, your expresses of love, each step to have that, just that intimate communication leads to ultimate satisfaction. Ultimate satisfaction. See, we get to one and two, and then we get stuck in number three, and then we go to the bedroom and we wonder, why is the bedroom so cold? Is because we haven't dealt with the issues. And he or she is not gonna say yes when everything else was, whoo, no way. And then we get mad because the conflict is so big, so we expect what is not going to happen because we are married. What we are is we are just undivorced. Undivorced. Why is that? Is because that conflict resolution has to be dealt with. How do we do that? I wanna share the opportunity that the door knocks and that opportunity it happens more than once. We can deal with conflict resolution, but we have to deal with it properly and we have to know what we're going to do. Proverbs chapter 12, verse 15, it says, the ways of fools seems right to them, but the wise listen to advice. You know, most cases in premarital counseling, uh, before you would get married, you'd have two or three sessions and we would talk about uh, marriage. We talk about uh, things going on and, and those three or four sessions, we learn a lot in those three or four sessions, but we are never prepared 
to go into a journey that's so overwhelming to us that we don't know how to have this conflict. We do not know how to talk. We are just like, what in the world takes place? And that's why we have to have that wise counsel. So when we do go into a journey and that conflict takes place, what do we do with that conflict? Let me tell you what most people do. Let me get a sand bucket. Let me stick my head in the sand. You put your head in the sand. And after the wind blows and that conflict is over with and we go to sleep and we wake up the next morning, we check the temperature, we find out if he or she is still in her mood or his mood, and then we come together and we can start talking again until the next conflict. We go back to the sandbox and stick the head in the sand. And our journey of our life is never have any resolution to any issue. And what happens, we are a volcano ready to explode because we've never dealt with the issues because that level three conflict resolution is scary to the majority of families. Why is that? Because sometimes it's very difficult just to be open and to be honest. Here's the conflict, is a, is a constant opportunity to do three things, to glorify God. When we go through conflict, we can glorify God. How do we glorify God? Because when we go through a conflict and we know that God is our Lord and God is our Savior, and we say, God, I need you. I need you to do this. I need you to come alongside me. In life, there's conflict. Cain and Abel, there was conflict. Adam and Eve, there was conflict. Every time that we have a relationship, whether it's a husband or a wife or a businessman, there's conflict. But when we want to deal with that conflict, we first have to say, God, I need you. What we are doing is we are humbly going underneath God. And we say, God, I need you to change me. Because sometimes in the conflict resolution, would you please change her? Fix her. If you would just fix her. If you would just tell her what to do. I've been praying about this for a month, and God, fix her. But God doesn't fix her. There's a problem with God. There's a problem with her. There's a problem with God. Yeah, I didn't just do what I want her to do. And then we humble ourselves. We find out that there wasn't a problem with God, and there wasn't a problem with her. There was a problem with me. And when I humble myself, then God opens up the door and shows me my issues. I can fix me. Because conflict can glorify God, and we can serve others. Sometimes conflict needs to be dealt with. Sometimes we need to do it. So when we, con when we have conflict, we can glorify God. We can serve others. And this is the most important thing. We can grow ourselves. We can grow ourselves. So I want to share with you how we can do that. How can we glorify God? How can we serve others? And how can we grow ourselves? We not, must remember, conflict is not a sin. Sin leads to conflict. It is nothing wrong with having conflict. Now, the problem is how you do conflict. I mean, if we have this overbearing, overpowering man and this shy, timid woman, and this woman's going to bow down to everything she's this, she said, there's not going to be any conflict. But ultimately, if there's respect, and you can say, this is truth in love. I can share what I want because I want to grow you and I want to grow me. Conflict. If we do not have the ability to communicate properly, we will never be able to settle issues. Here's the first one. Um, your part is to be self-aware. Not her aware or not him aware, self-aware. When I can deal with me, when I can ask God to deal with me, why, when, why is it when I go with these guys, I always do this? Why is it when every time I do this, something like this happens? We have to look at our life, we have to look at our actions, we have to look at our confrontational style, and we have to be very, Self-aware. When we have conflict, why is it that he or she won't talk to us? Why is it that they walk away instead of talk to? Am I 
overbearing? Am I, am I in their face so much that they're afraid to open up the can of worms? Because if I open up this can of worms, I have to open up the whole case of can. And you know what? There's not enough time in my life to talk about as much as she wants to talk about. So I don't, if, if she finds out about it, oh, I'll deal with this at a time. But conflict resolution is I have to be self-aware. Open up my life. In Psalms chapter 139, verses 23 and 24, being self-aware says this, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties and see if there is any wicked way in me. And here's what we have to say, and lead me in the way of everlasting. Lord, I have to be self-aware. Sometimes it's very easy for me to see your issues and I can say, dude, ba 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 you do all this stuff, Everything will be all right. But it's very difficult to turn around and see my own issues. It's very difficult. I have to ask God, search me. Find, make sure that I am who I need to be because the very first step of conflict resolution is looking at you. Not them, not her, not the church, not my dad, not my mom, not my past, me. How do I do and how do I deal with me? It's my responsibility, being self-aware. And if we ever got to the point that we are absolutely self-aware in every area, the conflict will then be easier to deal because we're not trying to be over them, we're trying to love them. The second is involve everybody immediately. If there's a conflict, we need to involve everybody immediately. We cannot allow the conflict to escalate to a point that is an absolute meltdown of a family. Sometimes, you know, you have those issues, and we've all had the family issues go on, and you, you go in there, and all of a sudden, it was supposed to be a family reunion, and now Aunt Jan's mad at Fred because Fred did this, and now they're mad, and they're not talking, and, and now Grandma's upset because they're upset, and now she's crying, and she doesn't want to cook, and you're sitting there, man, I just drove seven hours. I'm going to go to McDonald's. That's a waste of my time. There's con Every place you go, there could be conflict. Spiritually, there could be conflict. Okay, there, there is spiritual conflict. Um, Eugene Rogers, um, two weeks ago, he had a spiritual conflict. He was passing away, he had cancer, and he was about ready to die. He had this spiritual conflict because he did not know Christ. That's a major conflict, right? That's, a, that's the highest conflict that you could ever have in your soul that you know, this is what I need, but this is what I have. I don't know what to do to make that happen. So what was neat is uh, uh, Sandy and Christy called me and said, hey, could you stop by and, and see Dad? So we were heading to the camp, and I, was, I said, well, I, they said, I said, where do y'all live? They said, oh, we live right behind the casino. I said, oh, okay, let me see. Yeah, I've got a couple hundred dollars. I could go, no. Uh, yeah, I could book over to the, I could book over by your house. So we stopped over there. And it was Monday, June 1st at 11 o'clock. Eugene, cancer, body filled with cancer. I walked in, the girls were sitting there and I kneeled beside his bed and I said, hey, how you doing? And, and uh, I said, I'm a pastor. Can I just talk to you a little bit? And I asked him, do you know Jesus? He said, no. I said, would you like to meet Jesus? Yep. So we went through the Romans road and we talked a little bit. He bowed his head and he gave the most sweetest sinner's prayer. I'm a sinner. I need you. Forgive me and come into my heart. We had time, we talked a little bit and I walked out and drove down to the camp and one week, one week later, he took his last breath on this earth. That conflict was resolved because Jesus got involved. They're here today, and it was a wonderful time. The girls, they were scared to death because they knew that if he would have died before Jesus entered his life, they would have never seen him again. 
But you know what? When we did the, f the memorial service, it changes everything. Because there can be a reunion. That conflict was blown out because Jesus came in. And when we have conflict resolution, we have to look at those things. We have to put God in the center of those things. And what we can do is we can make things right. We have to make things right. When we know where those conflicts are, we have to say, I understand it. I'm part of it. I need to deal with it. And whatever it takes, we need to do it. If you have your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, verses 21 through 24. It says this, have you, you have heard that it is said if times of old, you shall not murder. And whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. But I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whoever says to his brothers, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whoever says you fool shall be in danger of hellfire. I, this is one that I, I have a hard time with because, I, honestly, the next phrase, because it looks like 75% of our church has a problem with their brother right here. Because when I read this, you'll understand. It says, therefore, if, if any of you have a gift at the altar, you're offering, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there, not in the offering plate, but just leave your gift there, at the altar and go your way and first be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. So clearly, over the last four or five months, we have a lot of brother problems because our offerings are down terribly. I, and it's not because I'm going on a mission trip. <laughs> it has nothing to do with that. It's just that's the way we are. But what happens, it says, listen, if God brings a, a problem with a brother or a sister or a coworker, a mom, a dad, to your heart. The Bible says the very first thing you do, you drop it, you deal with it. It's also saying your offering. It's not necessarily talking about your financial offering at the altar. You know what the offering is? It's my worship. He says, he says, I don't even want you to worship me until you do what I ask you to do. I don't want you to uh, be fake and not do what I have asked you to do. I have asked you, if you have an ought with your brother, if you have conflict with your brother, don't deal with me. Deal with him. Have a clean heart. And when you come back to the altar, you can worship me. And you can give to me because you have made the dirty spot of your heart clean. But until you can fix it, if you say, I don't care. I don't care if he likes me. I don't care if I ever deal with that. What you're saying is, God, I want you to take that part out of the Bible because I, I want to worship you, but I don't want to deal with him. And the Bible says we need to be self-aware. We need to take and make it right. Go to them. Humbly go to them and do whatever it takes Here's the deal. Worshipers initiate and seek peace. You cannot make it happen, but you must seek it to happen. You can't make somebody forgive you, but you can be the initiator with a very humbled heart. And it may be something deep and hurtful in your life that you have, I don't know how I would do this. We first can't look at them. We have to be self-aware and we have to go before God. We have to take that within our own heart. God gets mad at sin, but his first action is to love. He wants to reconcile with an apologer. He wants to recon recon reconcile with an apologer. When we say, Lord, I was wrong. I was wrong. What he does, he says, I know. I just want you to hear it. Isn't that what dads do all the time? I do that with my kids all the time. I mean, Brett is in trouble like every day. And I come in and I say, what are you doing here? What are you doing here? And, you know, I, I know what he's doing. I know where he's going. I just want him to hear it say, Dad, I was wrong. And I said, thank you. Here's where you were. Here's what you did. How much money you spent. I, already, I, had, the, I had the list of stuff. I knew everything that you did. But I want to know if you knew what you did. You know what? When you say, I apologize. In a conflict resolution, you know, you're saying, thank you. 
Thank you. Because out of a pure heart, I just want to acknowledge what you've done. You know, in culture, biblical culture, with friends on the same pier, they would, they would kiss each other on the lips. They would, they would greet each other. Or on a lesser scale, they would bow to one another. But in this culture, when there was a major conflict, when there was something that was deep, and there was an animosity, there was a hatred, and somebody says, I want to make this right. Here is their apology. You ready for this? I am sorry. I have hurt you. Please forgive me. Humbly, without looking eye to eye, I was wrong. I need you to forgive me. So if somebody had a problem with you, and they came to you, in our culture, we don't get on our knees and bow down face, prostrate before somebody, but that's the same mindset of conflict resolution, of asking somebody to forgive me with the heart of, I was wrong. I need you to forgive me. Now, if somebody comes to us with that mindset, we would automatically think, we would say, okay, you're forgiven. But sometimes they don't because our response is not, I will forgive you. Our response is, I want to kick you. Sure, there needs to be some communication about it. Here's how we need to do this. Avoid the words, but, if, or maybe. I would forgive you, but. What if you would do this? Maybe it wasn't all my fault. When you put any, any action or any hint that it is not my fault at all, your apology is saying, it's just like this, saying, go apologize to your brother. I'm sorry I hit you with the baseball. <laughs> There's no heart. There's no passion. The only time there'd be passion is I'll sit there and let him hit you with the baseball. Okay, oh, then you'd be apologetic about it. But what we have to do is we have to be apologetic. We can't leave any place for thought. The prodigal son is a wonderful picture of this. The prodigal son wanted all of his dad's inheritance, so they went off to a, a far land. He sold all of his or he, he spent all of his possessions. He partied all the time. And when he came broke, his friends left him. He had no money. He was eating out of the, of the, of the pig trough. And the Bible says right there, he came to himself. In other words, he said, I don't want to be here. He became self-aware, and he did something about his self-awareness. He went back to his father. Here's what he, tell me if you think this is what he said. Dad, if I hurt you when I left, will you apologize? Will you forgive me? Dad, maybe it wasn't all my fault. Maybe, maybe you were too hard on me and I left. Maybe it was your fault. But if, if you would have only given me some freedom, if you wouldn't have been so controlling, I would have never left. What would you think the dad would say? Dude, why don't you go back to the hog trough? But this is what the prodigal son said. Dad, I have sinned against you and against God. I am not worthy to even be your son. I would be honored if I would be just a servant of yours. I apologize. I hurt you. I was wrong. His dad picked him up. He said, put a ring on his finger. Put a coat on his back. Put shoes on his feet because my son was gone and now he has come home. We're going to have a party. And I truly believe when we look at conflict resolution, if we walk into that conflict with a pure heart, understanding self-aware, and I am not going to make excuses. I'm not going to say if, maybes, or ands. I'm going to say this is what I did. This is why I hurt you. This is what I'm going to own. I am not going to put a loophole in it. I'm going to stand for what takes place. We need to, we need to plan carefully. We need to, before we speak, don't tell them what you've done, but only your part of the conflict. Tell them what you did. 
Be completely honest. Never sugarcoat it. And then apologize. Apologize. In other words, explain yourself. You, you can say I'm sorry all day long. <laughs> and most would say, yep, you're pretty sorry. You are sorry. That was sorry. What you did was sorry. You hurt me. You were sorry. You're no good tramp. I can't stand you. I don't want to talk to you. Yep, you're sorry, all right. Saying I'm sorry doesn't fix anything. Apologizing comes from the root word that we get apologetics from. Apologetics means explain or to defend the, the faith. Apologize means I am sorry. I was wrong. This is what I did. This is what I did to hurt you. Explain your action. Put everything on the table and then say, will you forgive me? If we put everything on the table, it may make us think about what we're going to do before we have to apologize for what we did. Apology, explain it. Because if you don't explain it, you're gonna have to, oh, no, 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 no. If you say, man, will you apologize? Oh yeah, yeah. And then, no, we, did you do this, 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 this? I mean, it's, it's a four month ordeal. Just to apologize about one little thing. So why would you do it on purpose? is because that's what God wants you to do. And when you apologize, you explain yourself, you open up your heart, you open up your door, and you are transparent, you are humbled before them, and say, this is what I did. I hurt you, I was wrong, forgive me. That's the purpose, and that's what God does. And I love what he says here in Psalm chapter three, verse three. This is God. But you, O Lord, are my shield for me my glory, and the one who lifts up my head. What's that? When we talk to God before, and we have ought, we have sin, and we're asking God to forgive us. In the culture, they're down on their knees. This is how they're talking to God. They just, Lord, you're too holy. I respect you. And Psalm chapter 3 says, he is my shield. He will protect me when I'm sinning, when I'm hurting, but here's what he do. When I ask him for forgiveness, he stands up, he lifts up my chin, and he picks me up, and he restores me. That's what God does. When we do what God wants us to do, apologize, I am sorry, he picks me up and he saves me. And then he does this. Ask for forgiveness. Apologize, communicate the truth, and then Honestly, ask for forgiveness. Now, just because you ask for forgiveness does not mean you're going to have reconciliation. Reconciliation is I ask for forgiveness, you offer forgiveness, then we have reconciliation. But if I ask for forgiveness, but you do not give forgiveness, you are doing what God has asked you to do. Those who have been forgiven much should forgive. What Jesus did for us on the cross is enough for us to say, I need to forgive others. Remove your heart and vengeance towards the person while forgiving. You may never forget the offense. You're gonna always remember what took place. It may have been hurtful. It may have been devastating. It may be the worst time of your life. You may have to put that under the blood of Jesus Christ on a daily basis. But forgiveness is simply not forgetfulness. That's God. God can cast the sin behind his back, separate sin from the east, is from the west, bury it in the deepest sea, bring it to his remembrance no more. But guess what? We're not God. When somebody offends us, it's right there. And I guarantee you, it's going to stay right there. And I dare you to talk about that one again. But what forgiveness truly is, is I'm not gonna forget it, but I'm gonna promise God, and I'm gonna ask God to not use that as a vehicle to have vengeance, to hurt you, to belittle you, and to harm you. That's what I promise. Will you forgive me? Yes, I will forgive you. Reconciliation moves into the future. Now, the problem, we ask for forgiveness. We have to accept our consequences. 
We have to accept our consequences. Oh, there may be reconciliation. There may be forgiveness given. It may be a beautiful time with each other. But we have to accept our consequences. The Lord doesn't remember, but we do. You destroy trust in a relationship, and you don't put them back in the morning. When you lose trust, you lose everything. It takes time. It takes time. They're going to talk about things. They want to hear some things. But over a period of time, when, when those consequences are being put out, whether it's, whether it's something that you have to show I'm going to be faithful with, maybe it's your resources, maybe it's your time, maybe it's your job, maybe it's the money, whatever you have your issue with, you have to be trustworthy in that. It may take months or even years to get that trust back, but you have to pay the consequence. It may be a living nightmare, but if you love that person, if you absolutely adore that person, you will say, you are worth it. It is better to be married than to be undivorced. It's better to be married and happy than to cohabitate with somebody that you've been with for 20 years because you can't deal with these issues. Marriages fail daily because of level three. They are not willing to have conflict resolution because they're afraid that they have to accept the consequences. Because after you accept your consequences, the last one is the beautiful one. We have to alter your behavior. You know, there's some things that we just need to change. We have to change. The Bible says we have to, uh, we have, to have help. Help me work through this. What are the, what are the triggers? When, when, when you're walking through life with somebody that loves you, that, you, that you've been broken with, that you has forgiveness and they've restored you and, and you've gone through different issues within your life and there's somebody that you absolutely adore and they adore you and you are friends for life, what are the triggers? And you can ask them, what is it that, what is it that makes me do this? Or what is it that I say that just, that just makes you mad? Or why we have to open up and talk. Because sometimes we have a conflict and I say something or we do something or something happens and, uh, oh, where, where'd that come from? I, I didn't see that coming. That was out of left field. Well, you told me three weeks ago that you were going to do this and you haven't done it. I said, I was talking. I didn't say I was. Yes, you did. Let me tell you what. You, I have it right here on my iPhone. I put it on my notes. You said, duh, 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 duh. at three o'clock tomorrow afternoon, you said, or yesterday, you said that you're going to mow the yard. Well, guess what? You didn't do it. And because you didn't do it, you went and played golf. Golf's more important than me. What? No. <laughs> hey, Brett, can you go mow the yard? I got a three o'clock tea time. I said, yeah, it might be. So whatever we get a conflict in, we may get sidetracked. We may get blown away. But you know what? When that conflict takes place, what we can do is say, yes. We can communicate about it. We can talk about those triggers. We can talk about what makes us work or what makes us fail. Because Erica and Michael got married up here just yesterday and they're here today. Brand new couple, raise your hand, Erica and Michael. Great. Thank you for spending your honeymoon at church, all right. Woo, exciting. Um, <laughs> uh, I don't even know where I'm going now. Um, <laughs> When we have our love and we can talk about everything and we can share our life with everything and we can sit on a table, out on a deck, out looking over a pool and we can sit and talk about anything. Having someone you love going through life with you is the sweetest thing that you could ever have. But going through life with somebody you don't like, you're undivorced, is the worst thing that you can do. The best thing that you can do is be able to talk. Be able to get to that level three and say, we have a problem. I can't deal with all the problems. I can deal with a problem. I can tweak a couple things. I can move in this direction. I can do certain things. You know, when we 
do what God has called us to do. I'm going to make a change right here in, in what I was going to do, guys. We're going to, I'm going to bring a sermon conclusion right here. Um, there's a song that I'm going to end my sermon with. I was going to sing it, <laughs> but I'm going to have you sing it. I'm going to have you sing it. When we see that I have a life and I want to move forward in that life, and there's a conflict. I, I love the person I'm with. I, when we were dating, we would do anything for each other. We would spend time with each other. We would talk on the phone. We, we would just listen to each other breathe. Now, are you done? Click. I mean, come on. Is there something you have to say to me? Oh, phones are worthless. Just text it to me. Tell me what you want, okay? Back in the early days, we would walk miles. We would listen to each other pant on the phone. We would do whatever we need to do. Today, today, in our relationships, there has to be some give and take. Would you agree with that? It's called compromise. There's a song by Diamond Rio. It says, meet me in the middle. It's an awesome song. Anybody know it? You well, we're going to have a contest right now. Okay? We're going to have a contest. I in relationship conflict. It all boils down to that. If you love somebody, will you sacrifice? If you truly need something fixed, will you humble yourself? Relationships will never be fixed if we have the philosophy, you will do what I tell you to do. It'll never be fixed. The Bible talks about mutual submission, mutual respect. I want this, you want this. How can we get what we both want? And we do that through love, by honoring each other, by honoring God, by not allowing the junk within our life to be buried in the sand, to ignore it until it blows up to the point that we have no relationship if we love each other, we must talk to each other. Because if we do not have the vehicle of communication within any relationship, it is almost done. The word I've used three times is non-divorced. You've ever seen it? They're married, but they have no marriage. Wow, that's fun. But you know what you can do? Symbolically? Symbolically? I'm wrong. I want this more than I want this. I want my heart. I want my life. I want this relationship more than I need my pride. Because if I have this... I'm happy. And when I'm happy, humbled, God does great things. Listen to what this last scripture says. I think it's my last scripture. Proverbs chapter 16 says, These six things doth the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination to him. A proud look, somebody that's arrogant cocky, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked imaginations, feet that swift to run to mischief, a false witness that bears lies, and he that soweth discord among the brethren. The family. If we are divisive with our family, with the church, God says he hates divisiveness. What he loves is unity. He loves unity in the body of Christ. And you know what your home is? If you're a Bible, if you're a, a faith family, you are a church. And what we have to do is we have to bring our church in your home to unity. Whether it starts with mom and dad, it starts with kids, we have to bring it to unity. Because God hates division. He loves unity. So what does it take? It takes prayer. It takes an act 
of a will to say, I want this now. I am willing to forgive. I am willing to humble. I am willing to move forward. That's what God is asking our families to do. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Father, Lord, we come before you. We love you. We thank you. I pray that you'll be with us. Be with our families. Lord, be with our relationships. Lord, be with our conflicts. When we walk out these doors, we are going to remember the conflicts and the issues of our life. And I pray that the first thing that we do is we look internally. We evaluate. We become self-aware. We look at my time, my situation, and we deal with it properly, humbly, quickly. Make our homes strong. Make our families strong. Make our church strong through unity. We ask you for that. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen.